Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Alexander Stubb, and I'm the director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome you to our Florence Live conversations. And today, our big theme is going to be America and the world in 2021. And of course, this is a very timely day to have this conversation today, not least because we have probably seen what could be called the shortest concession speech uh, in the history of American presidencies in the form of a tweet. We have also seen uh, an avalanche of foreign policy nominations coming from the Biden administration. And uh, I think we probably have well, the best possible panel to have a conversation with us today. Let me begin with the introductions. The first one, a warm welcome to Anne Applebaum, who you will know as a journalist, historian and author. She's been writing uh, for The Economist, for The Spectator, for The Washington Post, and is currently working um, with The Atlantic. She's actually joining us from Poland, where I think she finished her last book, The Twilight of Democracy, uh, and not only that, worked on one of her Pulitzer Prize, Prize winning books, Gulag, A History. It's lovely to have you uh, and with us. Secondly, I would like to introduce uh, my good friend and uh, almost you could say neighbor, uh, Carl Bildt, who you will know as a politician uh, and a diplomat, former prime minister of Sweden and also former foreign minister of Sweden. And that was probably the time when the two of us got to know each other. Uh, you could almost say intimately uh, in the span of four years, working together pretty much uh, day and night over various uh, issues. Now, Carl has not only been a prime minister and foreign minister, but also one of the main mediators and EU and UN reps uh, in the Balkans. Writ written a lot of books. The last one I read from him is wonderful. Uh, actually, in Swedish, it's called Ured and Steed. Uh, you could say sort of the world of uh, the disorder, uh, if you will. He's uh, currently, among other things, uh, co-chair of the European Council for Foreign Relations. The last and third uh, of our guests uh, tonight uh, is, a no is no stranger to European and American affairs, Peter Spiegel, who is currently the US managing editor of the Financial Times, uh, my favorite newspaper, may I add. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, he was a political uh, news or news editor in London, and Brussels chief, bureau chief. We got to know each other, uh, well, pretty much over 10 years in, in Brussels, dealing with a whole bunch of different things. So a warm welcome uh, to all of you and welcome to everyone on the program today. Now, the way we, in which we've set it up is we basically have uh, four themes. The first theme is gonna be about the election campaign, the results and transition. The second one about what will change with the Biden administration the third one about the nominations, and then the fourth one is probably the most interesting. That's because two of our wonderful master students from our program uh, will be posing questions. To all of those online, you're more than welcome to post questions for the chat. They will be collected and thrown in my direction uh, by uh, Jonas uh, uh, Brendenbach, and I'll try to pick them up as we go along. Well, let's begin with our first theme, uh, the election campaign, the result, and the transition. Of course, this was a grueling um, uh, campaign as always, but quite different because of COVID. So there wasn't as much uh, traveling involved, uh, um, as much work, but the language used was really, really rough. And uh, could you begin, Anne, by comparing this election uh, to what we have seen in the United States in previous elections? I mean, what's your sense about the whole election process, the actual election, the result, and then the transition? So what was really unusual about this election, and of course this is one of the elements that's been unusual about the Trump presidency, is that the, 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 one of the candidates, the, the Trump campaign's uh, main goal was to convince Americans of an entirely false um, uh, view of the world. So what Trump sought to do was to convince people that the COVID pandemic was either unimportant or over, um, that the economy um, that he had inherited from Obama and then bumped up and pumped up with, um, with borrowed money was the best in history, um, that his foreign policy, which was one of you know, retreat and absence and 
um, uh, you know, and 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 loss of of American influence and power was somehow great as well. Um, and what Trump had to do was um, convince a sufficient number of Americans of this entirely false premise. Um, and although he lost, and it, in fact he lost quite decisively, it was not a close election. Um, he did, in the course of the election and in the course of his presidency he has created a kind of alternate reality in which a lot of his voters and supporters will continue to live. Um, and what we saw, of course, after the election was over, well, which is after he was really quite soundly and clearly defeated, was that he then spent two weeks pretending that the election wasn't over, pretending that he'd actually won, creating using a set of fake lawsuits and frivolous um, legal cases um, and propaganda, again, to convince his supporters of this entirely false picture of reality. Um, and a portion of them, we, we, you know, depends on which poll you look at, but it may be quite a large proportion, have continued to believe this and may well continue to believe it for a long time. And so what Trump managed to do was create this kind of split in reality in America. So there's there are now two tribes of people who don't just have different opinions about politics, they actually have different sets of facts. Um, and that is a problem that is going to continue to plague US politics for a long time. And we can talk later about what the Biden administration is doing to try to overcome it. But Trump used some inherent distrust in the system. He then deepened it, broadened it, um, and then in used that in order to create a, um, a, a you know followers, believers, um, supporters, who will now, who, who no longer trust any other politicians or political figures, and who now, as I say, live in this alternative world, and they will continue to live there. Great. Okay, Peter, I'll bring you in after that, because obviously you wrote a wonderful piece uh, just a couple of days back uh, in the FT. Uh, U.S. democracy could emerge stronger after Donald Trump's assault. Georgia's Secretary of State survived a frontal attack by a sitting American president, and so will the country. Now, uh, Anne would probably disagree with that. She's quite worried <laughs> that 73 million people voted for Donald Trump and believed in his narrative. And that, as a matter of fact, democracy is still under attack and it ain't going to be over, not even after these two weeks. Defend your case here, Peter. So yes, I think my role now on the international talking circuit is to be the optimist to Anne's pessimist. So I, I'm, I happily take up that, that cudgel. Uh, well, let me just talk about the campaign itself. I mean, Anne is completely right. I mean, one of the weird things, frankly, is, is running a news organization, or at least running the U.S. end of the FT over the last two or three weeks, is this alternate reality that's going on. Most people we've been writing about and we talked to, and even Republicans in that regard, have treated Trump largely in this whole effort as sort of, you know, silliness with contempt. But on... The, the, on the alternate news stations, and I don't even mean Fox in this regard, I mean, you're talking new nation networks like OAN and Newsmax, they're, you know, Newsmax was not calling Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin until relatively recently. I mean, it is an alternate reality. That is absolutely true. But let's just, the, the positives, first of all, record turnout, right? You know, Joe Biden will have, I think just today, we're still counting here in New York, uh, over 80 million votes, the most ever for American president, highest uh, percentage turnout for a U.S. presidential race, and I think in a century, and you know, having spent a lot of time in Europe and looking at the at the, the, the turnout rates that normally happen in Europe, you know, the U.S. is always so much lower. That's good news. Do you have the take, percentage? Do you have the percentage of the turnout, Peter? It's I, still I coming through know. because we're still counting votes, but it's in the it's oh, it's high sixties or low seventies is probably where it's okay. going to really land out. So, um, it was a COVID election, and we seem to have been able to do it without. Well, we having we're going through some outbreaks now, but largely safely and without 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 incident. And the biggest fear that I had, frankly, was a repeat of, of 2016, which is Russian interference, foreign interference in the election. That apparently hasn't happened either. So the election itself, relatively uh, executed, uh, you know, uh, seamlessly and and frankly in in good stead. Um, I guess where I am trying to project a little bit of optimism in this post-election period is. Let's try to, to to sort of jump forward to to January 20th. What is going to happen on January 20th? On January 20th, despite all this craziness that's going on with the lawsuits, with the inviting Michigan state legislatures to the White House, is Joe Biden will be inaugurated president pretty much without incident. We're not going to see troops leaving their barracks or anything insane like that. And one thing I have learned, and Alex and, and, and Carl, you, you probably experienced this more directly than I have, it is amazing to me having followed politics both in Europe and the US, is how quickly power seeps from the hands of a, of a losing 
uh, uh, politician. And I think people forget the power of the American presidency. And when Joe Biden becomes president and with all that comes with being the commander in chief of the U.S. military and, the, and, and on the global stage, I think Donald Trump becomes sort of an afterthought. Now, he's going to be able to to control, as Ann says, the, 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 the conspiracy minded element of the Republican Party. And it is slightly frightening that 73 million, 74 million Americans somehow thought that this was a normal behavior for the president and wanted to return him to office. But I, I guess I, I will look, try to look forward at January 20th and then try to look back and I will see a system that actually kind of functioned, right? The, the, the founding fathers were very worried about an authoritarian president with authoritarian impulses, developed a decentralized checks and balances system that was able to, that was designed to, to deal with that. And you know what? It worked, right? We had a Republican Secretary of State in Georgia who certified the election, the, the election and told Lindsey Graham and others to go take a hike. You know, we had a Republican uh, canvasser, you know, had a canvassing board in Michigan who voted with his Democratic colleagues. You know, all these systems we have in place that we were worried about a constitutional crisis from the military to our local officials all seem to have worked. And I guess my hope is, and I think it's a prediction, but I'll, I'll make it keep it a, as a hope for it now, is that when we look back on January 20th or 21st of what happened is Americans will realize that the system that you thought that Donald Trump was going to crush and assault with all the power the American presidency has actually survived the greatest threat that it's had since, I don't know, the Civil War or whatever you want to pick and survived pretty well and delivered the result that we all thought should happen. So that's what gives me some some optimism. And I guess that's a trajectory that we're looking at. I don't know about you guys, but I felt from the beginning when the transition started and Trump started to make all the noise that this is just noise basically for the next election in 2024. And the interesting thing, though, is do you remember, and Carl, I'll hand it over to you in a second, we used to define the democracy as a country where the, the, the previous leader did not have to leave the country, uh, be killed or have to go to jail. <laughs> I think, you know, we can still keep that definition going. Uh, of course, for the we don't time, know being, for the time being, you know, the New York prosecutor's office being, may have, you, may have yeah, something to yeah, say we, about that. But, uh, we, yeah. we, we don't know. How about you, Carl? I mean, what's your take? I mean, you've, you've followed, obviously, you're like myself, an avid transatlanticist. Uh, you know, you've, you've followed the American elections probably, you know, since the 1960s and 70s. And, and now we've had Trump and everything. Around. Happy, How did you assess? No, I'm happy you didn't bring in the 1950s as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I followed it from sort of two different angles, really. One angle is, Alex, you and I have fought and lost and won elections over a couple of decades. And then you sort of follow what's really happening. And of course, I was somewhat surprised, many of us were, that Trump did as well as he did. Uh, he did significantly better than practically every opinion poll had predicted. And I had two explanations for that. First, I have to say, reluctantly, that uh, he's a ferociously good campaigner. And uh, I know from experience, particularly the last week, the last days are decisive in getting the votes out, uh, getting enthusiasm. He did it. Uh, while uh, Biden was fading during the final days, uh, Trump was accelerating. In my experience from election campaign, it makes a hell of a lot of difference. Second is that he did succeed to get uh, the economy more in focus than uh, one would have thought would have been possible with COVID dominating the lives of people and with the economy going downhill or had, having gone downhill. But if you look at the post-election uh, opinion polls, most people thought that the economy was going well and, and that he'd improved the economy and illustrated all of the reasons why that was the case. But... Um, he illustrated to a certain extent the truth of the old Clinton uh, famous saying, it's the economy stupid. He capitalized on that. Um, so we are where we are. I, I, I think uh, many of us discussed uh, prior to the election, immediately afterwards, the different extremely troubling scenarios for what could happen. And uh, there was every reason to be extremely worried because, as Peter said, I mean, the, the, uh, the presidency, the power of the Oval Office is immense. And when you have a madman in the Oval Office intending to destroy an election result and uh, having a lot of followers who actually believe every single word of what he says, it, was, it looked really dangerous for a while. Uh, as we see today, I think things are gradually turning out better than certainly what I had feared. I mean, the slow march of the own institutions, to use that phrase, has worked. The one small step after the other. Uh, the one court here and the one Republican there and the one step there and the one step there. And it adds up to something 
that has destroyed even the possibilities of a madman with all of the powers of the executive office. So he's fading fairly soon, um, at least from the presidency. Uh, then, of course, one of the big issues is where, where which direction is the Republican Party going to go? What's going to be the power of Trump? Um, will history show that uh, it, whether it was Biden or Trump that was the parenthesis? Um, that remains to be seen. Yeah, and I guess that's a big question as well. I mean, I, I do agree with you. And I think obviously, you know, had COVID not struck and had this not been, uh, in the words of Peter, a COVID election, and uh, had it been in the words of Carl Bildt, uh, it's the economy, stupid. I think uh, Donald Trump would have uh, cruised into a second four years mm -hmm. uh, in the White mm -hmm. House, which I think, you know, should make everyone who loves liberal democracy and, and f mm -hmm. how would I say, um, democratic institutions think twice. That's why I've been a little bit worried about all the sort of schadenfreude that's coming along about the Clint, about the uh, Trump uh, voters. Uh, because remember that these guys are going to vote again in four years. And, and, you know, we can clearly see now that if you push the narrative of rejecting the other, you're not going to win the game. But Alex, I'm going to jump in here, I guess, to give go, plug go to, it, to, to, to Anne's book, because this is exactly what her book is mm -hmm. on. And I just, even mm -hmm. being a student of European history, the, the, the point that, that, for instance, the, you know, the, the French nationalism that rise with the Dreyfus affair is carried on up until Vichy. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, it, it, it's, I mean, Anne, you, you put it better than I do, but I was just very struck. And part of the reason, frankly, I found your book so depressing is that what Anne argues mm -hmm. is that these are not momentary blips in history, that mm -hmm. there are elements within our all our democratic societies that it, and some time in history begin to pick their head above the parapet and then carry on for a time. So mm -hmm. I think your, your, your worry is right, Alex, and I think Anne's book is, is very much a, a, a diagnosis of that, that possibility. Can yeah, you, I mean, Anne, give us your, 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 your pessimistic view and your optimistic view <laughs> of the ramifications of the election? I mean, you know, first of all, I think it's actually irresponsible to be pessimistic. I think it's unfair to our children and to your students. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't ever, you know, stand in front of big groups and say everything's finished. You know, that's just not how, um, that's just not how, that's just not how I look at the world. I mean, I think it's very important to be realistic. Um, that's the, you know, and Realistically, the United States still faces these very major problems. It faces major internal problems. Um, it faces the problem, as I said, of this divided reality um, of this kind of this kind of epistemological crisis of people living in different realities inside one country and the difficulty of having politics, you know, knit together again um, after that. Um, you know, it faces, there are a lot of things that have accelerated because of the COVID pandemic. One of them is inequality. Um, lots of people have done perfectly well out of the coronavirus. Um, and in fact, I, I disagree with you slightly. I mean, I think in fact, there are many people who voted for Trump because they'd done all right out of it. They liked his rhetoric about it being over and they wanted to move on. Um, and so inequality has been accelerated. Um, the move from um, you know, away from mainstream or whatever you call traditional sources of information, but also traditional employment um, onto new online, um, you know, into a new online economy and a new online information space has also been accelerated. Um, and that is bringing with it all kinds of rapid, rapid changes that, um, you know, that will cause political disruption in the future. I mean, look, just to finish, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests of last summer and the the anger on both sides that they that they created, some of that was real and that it was a, it was about the issue that it was meant to be about, namely um, racial discrimination in the United States. But some of it also felt to me like a reaction. It was frustration. It was frustration about being locked up. It was it was frustration at the slowness of the political process. Um, and it's just not an accident that we've been so many demonstrations just like this all over the world, actually, um, in recent years, you know, as people don't feel represented by politics, they don't feel that, you know, in a world where everything happens so quickly that politics responds fast enough to them. Um, and we need some pretty radical answers to that, I think. Of course, and nowadays with media, social media and technology, it's so easy for anyone, any individual to do with the compare and the contrast and basically draw a conclusion, hey, why am I not as well off as that person, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The interesting thing, I think I read in The Economist that the uh, lowest 5% in terms of uh, median income in the United States uh, became richer uh, during, uh, during Donald Trump. So again, you know, all of these people who are sort of wondering why, for instance, uh, Hispanics in, 
in Florida were voting for uh, for Trump. You know, they although, gave their answer. Statistically, poor Americans voted for Biden and wealthier Americans voted for Trump. Be very careful because it's very easy to fall into these cliches about, you know, who's a Trump voter and who's not. And, and much of the middle class is pro-Trump and much of the, you know, you know, less wealthy Americans are not. So it's a yeah. No, it's, it's, it's obviously it's it's virtually impossible to generalize because none of us are in the booth, but you can get a mega trend out of it. Now, let, let, let me reverse the order a little bit, because if we touched upon the, the issue, OK, you know, this is a day uh, of transition. It's been admitted by 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 Trump now, hoping rather begrudgingly that we are moving on. Let, let's do the nominations first and, and let's do it in the order of, 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 of Peter. Carl and, and and this time around. Peter, you know, we've had a few key nominations coming out today. Uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, John Kerry, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, Janet Ellen, uh, among others. Uh, pick a few. Uh, give us a couple of uh, character assessments and thoughts. Well, Peter. let's take the two big ones, which are Yellen and Blinken. And, and I'll, I'll do both very quickly. The, the thing I find very frustrating slightly, even in, in the US about the analysis of Biden's picks is, oh, it's it's the boring old guys who are coming back in for a boring administration and that's what Biden wants. Yes, to a certain extent, but I actually think both Blinken and Yellen could be incredibly interesting in their positions. Blinken, because I think if we look at Blinken as Secretary of State and compare them to Trump, okay, there's nothing that is going to look like the Trump administration, thank God. But actually, if you look at Blinken and compare him to Obama, which I think is the more instructive thing to do, this is not going to be Obama three. And I think what people are missing slightly because people don't remember is there were actually some tensions between what I would call the, the, the Obama camp and the Biden camp within the Obama White House. And it was because Biden comes from a much more sort of Dean Acheson, liberal internationalist tradition of the Democratic Party, right? Democracy promotion, human rights promotion, the role of yeah. America in the world is to lean forward a bit, uh, not necessarily militarily, but with diplomatic tools and, and, and you know, Things like Belarus, you know, you will see the the uh, a Biden administration, and I think Tony Blinken be much more aggressive on the need for human rights and democracy promotion in a Belarus than a, than a Biden administration, than an Obama administration would have been. So I think what people are going to see in Blinken, um, and and why I don't think he's going to be quite as boring as, as some of the initial takes are going to be, is it's going to be again. Remember what happened when Obama became president. There was a the, the, the sense of that democracy promotion was a good thing was completely obliterated by the fact that George Bush used that as a pretense for war. So if you were a Democrat and you tried to promote democracy promotion, you know, you were no longer seen as a viable candidate. And that's how Obama became president. He was, I don't want to say a neo-isolationist, but he clearly was more Kissingerian and, and, and was more, you know, less interested in, in promoting, you know, don't do stupid Poop. That was his main foreign policy, you know, outlook. And so there, those within the, the Obama administration, Blinken was one of them. Uh, Mike McFaul was another one who, who had made careers in trying to get American values promoted abroad. Were kind of in, in the back of the back of the bus type thing. So the fact that Blinken is coming in, and I think Biden has written about this in Foreign Affairs. Um, I think the return of the democracy agenda under a, Obama, yeah. a Biden administration will be very interesting to watch. One last thing: of I, democracies, right? Yeah, exactly. He wants to have a summit of democracies. I mean, that's that's in his piece. I mean, it'll be very. It's not Ooh. an Obama thing, right? Is is Victor Orban invited to the summit of democracies? You know, uh, I can say the same for 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 Anne's Anne's home country. You know, are the polls invited? Is peace invited to to a summit of democracies? It'll be interesting to watch. One last thing on Yellen, because I think Yellen also is unfairly labeled as sort of a, a dull pick. Um, she comes from a very interesting. Uh, strain of de economic thinking uh, in American and frankly in global economics, which is that you know she was at the Fed. She thinks that central banking should care as much about labor markets as about inflation, and that's kind of revolutionary until about ten years ago. And and it's why the left is much more comfortable with her as a Treasury Secretary than say Lael Brainard. You know she does believe there is a role for the federal government, both monetarily and fiscally, to get people to work. And that's a little bit left of center, and it's 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 much more left of center than anyone that Obama had, which was a little bit more from the sort of the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. So I think both Blinken and Yellen will turn out to be much more interesting as cabinet secretaries and perhaps the initial takes have been. That's great. And of course, I mean, Ellen, she, Ellen, she, she did her PhD on labor economics and had a mm. professorship in that as well. And that's an interesting mix. Uh, how about you, Carl? I mean, you've, you've probably met all of them. 
uh, all of the above, if you will. Can you give us a, a couple of uh, character assessments or thoughts? Well, I read the I read the foreign and security policy types, who I I know yeah. them fairly well since X numbers of years back. Uh, but I mean, first let 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 let's point out the obvious. Uh, Donald Trump is president of the United States until the 20th of January. And you can see uh, Mike Pompeo running around the world and, and, and creating mischief. Uh, so we should not underestimate what might happen in the days that is running up to uh, the 20th of January. They, they, are, they are busy planting landmines, burning bridges, doing whatever they can to create additional difficulties for the Biden team on the foreign and security side. Um, the good thing is, of course, that we will have sort of Biden, a perfectly normal human being, in the Oval Office, that's a change. I mean, the bar is fairly low. Uh, and, and an extremely experienced team. And as for the politics of that particular team, I mean, they are in favor of things like the European Union, like the United Nations. I mean, might not sound that sensational, but against the background of the last four years, quite something. They might even be in favor of democracy. Um, so this is going to be, uh, the, there's going to be a honeymoon with Europe. Paris Agreement, climate, John Kerry coming back, uh, that kind of re remaining in the WHO, uh, JCPOA might be somewhat more difficult, but they will start to talk with the Europeans on how to do that. So a distinct honeymoon in Europe. Uh, but then, of course, comes the fact that the world has changed, and, and both Tony Blinken and, and, and Jake Sullivan, well, that's going to be the team. Uh, they have spent quite some time thinking about what has been happening during the last four years. So it's not going to be sort of you know, Obama coming back. Uh, these are people who have learned quite a lot and spent some time thinking about it as well. And and doing it together, which is interesting. Um, so it's going to be, I mean, it's the most tradition. And then we're going to have um, a restoration of the State Department. The State yeah. Department has been a ruin uh, during these four years. Uh, and now State Department and American diplomacy is coming back. Uh, I guess there's jubilation in every single corridor, every single floor of the State Department over the, the news of Tony Blinken. How about you, Anne? You've, you've met many of them and actually some of them even recently. What, what's your take on, on say, Blinken, Sullivan? Uh, so I think, I think Peter is right. I mean, the, the question is to what degree um, this is an administration which it's not, I mean, of course it's going to be different from Trump. The question is how different is it from Obama? Um, and I do think they are, um, certainly Blinken and Sullivan are, are, you know, I mean, there's, there's sort of two camps inside Biden world. And one is a sort of restorationist, you know, let's just put everything back the way it was. And then there's another camp that says, no, some of that stuff wasn't working that well anyway. And we need to, we need to be a bit more creative in the future. Um, I would put both Blinken and certainly certainly Sullivan in that latter camp. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is what that means. Um, you know, it's all very well to sort of get all the democracies together once again, but what are you going to do with them? You know, what's the what's the goal? You know, we had this experience in the past, actually. Uh, Madeleine Albright, when she was Secretary of State, tried to create a community of democracies and an institution was set up, and I think it still exists, And but it has no money, it has no attention, it has no role. Um, and it's partly because it didn't, do anything. Um, and what we what 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 I would like to see the administration do, and there are certainly some inside who who will want this, um, is to have the democracies do some joint projects. Um, you know, go, you know, regulate the internet. You know, talk, have a deeper conversation about the role of the internet platforms. Are they really working for us? Are they are they helping our democracies or harming them? Um, you know, end money laundering and this massive, you know, you, dark money that's, you know, swirls around the world and infects all of our, all of our democracies. Um, you know, what can we do together as democracies? What can we change, you know, as a group and as a team um, that would make a difference to our public? Um, incidentally, you know, Sullivan has been involved in a project. I mean, it hasn't got a lot of attention, but it's interesting and worth noting, um, which was, which was located at a number of, um, Midwestern and, and sort of American universities looking at what is the effect of American foreign policy and what's the relationship between American foreign policy and sort of ordinary middle class people. Um, and what he was looking for and what the project was trying to look at was how do we re-explain foreign policy to Americans? How do we get Americans invested in what America does abroad? Um, and how do we make sure that that's who we're working for? You know, that it's not some kind of elite project. Um, and I think if they 
if they could refocus the, the democratic world on these projects that would help and strengthen American democracy, that would make um, a big difference. I mean, of course, the other really important and central theme that we're gonna hear over and over again about in the next few months and years um, is China. And there will be an attempt to, again, organize the democratic world so that there's a single trade policy, so there's a single economic policy, so there's a kind of single line towards China. Whether that will work, I don't know, but that's that is another that's another one of their goals. That's good. Let's then look at, you know, okay, what will change? Because uh, the world used to be fairly, wow, uh, I guess clear and understandable. You knew what you would get with an American president if he, I guess, in this particular case, would be a Democrat or uh, a Republican. But with Trump, that went a little bit topsy-turvy. You really, you really didn't know what you were getting into. Uh, and you never believed that he was going to do the things that he ended up doing. And now we're going sort of back to the normal. But may I may I just pose the question, how much back to the normal? Is this just a change in style? Uh, and will the substance remain the same? And, I, I, you know, are we going back to what kind of an American foreign policy? And uh, I'll start with, with Carl and then I'll hand it over to, to Peter. So what's going to change now? Tell me. <laughs> well, it is a different word. I mean, the word has moved on. And, and as Anne said, it, it's uh, to a large extent China, but it's also other things. I mean, the number one and the number two and the number three thing is going to be COVID. We are in the middle of a pandemic that is transforming societies around the world. And uh, there's no doubt that that is going to be the number one priority. And the number two priority is then going to be to prepare the world to meet the next pandemic. So those sorts of issues that very few people thought about in any sort of organized ways before are going to be front and center. Then China, it's another word. I mean, to go back to sort of full-scale multilateralism is not going to work in the way that it used to be. Uh, and uh, how to meet challenge uh, China is going to be one of the defining issues in the US debate and in the transatlantic debate. That issue was hardly there if we go back sort of eight years in time to take a somewhat longer time perspective. Uh, we've touched briefly on the thought of all of the digital issues. Uh, we are in the beginning of the digital age. And uh, that means that is going to transform uh, society. We are in a world of geotechnological competition that is very different from what we had on the agenda before. Uh, so it's a, it's a very different agenda. agenda. Uh, if we compare it to four years or eight years ago. It's less traditional, uh, more transformative, uh, requires much more thinking, and um, uh, much more is at stake uh, if you look at primarily the Chinese, but not only the Chinese development. Yeah, I think that's really well put, because to a certain extent what's happening is that we're fighting the old battles, and we want to go back into some Some comfortable transatlantic relationship that we used to have, you know, where... China wasn't well, a big player, but you know the world is, is, is completely different, and that's going to be reflected with, in Biden's foreign policy. And it's going to be one of with, these sort of high expectations. Yeah, yeah. High expectations we still got the Russians. The yeah, yeah, we still got the Russians around, though. I yeah, one thousand three hundred kilometers of border with them as well. So you mm -hmm. know, there you go, Peter. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on on Carl's point, I think you know, obviously, COVID will be in the near term the most important. You know, if you want to consider that a foreign policy issue, but I want to get back to the primacy mm -hmm. of China, particularly as it, it looks here in 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 the U.S. Because um, what has changed, I think, over the last four years in particular is. No longer can American president talk about engagement with China. And I don't think Biden's instincts are to engage with China. There will be a different way to confront China. But remember, this, the, 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 the Obama administration, uh, and frankly, going back to Bush and Clinton, were trying to, you know, the, the, the responsible stakeholder argument, if you just bring China into the system, they will eventually begin to act like we are. They will, they will respect international law. They will begin to, to do, you know, implement human rights. There'll be a middle class, will demand democracy. That clearly has not happened. And actually the reverse, with Xi Jinping, we've seen a reverse of any of these things we consider as Western values. So there's going to have to be a reckoning with China and how Biden approaches that without doing slightly crazy trade wars and this kind of stuff, I think will be really interesting to watch. And that's going to be the most where the action is. And I think, um, as, as, as Alex, as you were saying, that when I was in Brussels, I remember, you know, the Obama administration repeatedly sending emissaries to Brussels and European capitals saying, hey, help us out here. Can you help us out in the South China Sea? Can you help us out on, on, on 5G and, and on intellectual property? And in general, 
Brussels and and certainly Berlin, because I remember Merkel going repeatedly to, to China and being a very mercantilist approach. Can you just buy German stuff? David Cameron very similarly, Nicolas Sarkozy very similarly, saw China as a market as opposed to a geostrategic challenger. I think that's all going to change. And it'll be interesting to see the European reaction to that now that they have an interlocutor in Biden, who is a bit more pro-European. Um, on Europe, I will just also say that I think that also is likely, if, if we're looking for an area where we could go back to normal, normal is, is, is not the right word, but Obama was an instinctive, remember the pivot to Asia. He kind of saw Europe as yesterday's news. I want to focus on this big, dynamic, growing Pacific region. But what happened over the course of his eight years, I think, is crisis has happened, right? You had Libya happened. You had crisis in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and, and instinctively, you look around the world and say, okay, who's with us? Who can we rely on? Who has our values? Who has deployable militaries? And it tends to be Europe. And, and that is something I think Obama came to late um, and probably with not as, quite as, as, as instinctive emotion as perhaps uh, previous Democratic presidents. But I think Biden is raised in that cauldron, for lack of a better word. He is the first senior American official to speak at the European Parliament, for instance. And he was he, he has a much more, particularly, Carl, as you were pointing out, Russia. You know, he is he was the guy that was sent by Obama to Tbilisi and to and to Kiev to reassure the near abroad that they haven't forgotten about them. Right. He is the guy who really does believe that that Russia's overreaching efforts in in the near abroad is dangerous in, ex in, in a way that, frankly, Obama didn't. And I, I think you would see much more uh, pressure on the Europeans to stand up to the Belarusians, to stand up to uh, Lukashenko, uh, to be much more active in Ukraine and, and, and some of these these areas where, you know, if you are sitting in, in Warsaw or you're sitting in one of the Baltics, you know, I think frequently I remember when I would show up in these places and they would hear my American accent, they would say, we joined the EU, we joined NATO. Why aren't you guys helping us out here with the Russians? And, and I think their, their, their feeling is that you talk to the French, you talk to the Italians, they don't really care. They're, they're, you know, even the Germans are looking for their gas deal with Gazprom, right? It was supposed to be the Americans who would show up and say, don't worry, we're here. We'll send in the Marines if, 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 the, if the Russians start moving into the Baltics. And I think you're going to see a much more proactive Biden administration on those kinds of issues with the Europeans in particular. Good. Let me transfer it over to Anne. I think that's quite a good bridge. I must admit, though, I do apologize when I mentioned 1,300 kilometers of border with Russia and you said primacy of China, boom, my internet connection was cut off. <laughs> so I blame the uh, Russians, we, still yeah. have, we still have very good buffers here. Um, Anne, please go ahead. So, I, I mean, I, I won't repeat much of what Carl and Peter says I agree with, but you know, the really most important thing that's changed over the last few years, um, the last four years, is that America's position in the world has changed. Um, America is not the unquestioned leader of the democratic world anymore. Um, America creates a lot of suspicious feeling internally in its allies. I mean, I've seen polls showing that Germans were more afraid of Trump than they were of Putin or of Xi. Um, um, you know, I've seen polls showing that um, South Korea and very high numbers, 60 percent, 70 percent of South Koreans and Japanese find the United States to be a dangerous country. And those are our most important Asian allies um, in the in the struggle or confrontation against China. Um, the United States is increasingly left out of all kinds of decisions all over the world. Um, you know, look, we've just had a war in the Caucasus between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The U.S. played no role in it, it was completely invisible. Um, and the you know, in the end of the day, the 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 the, the ceasefire was negotiated by the Russians and the Turks. Um, you know, it's Russian, Turkish, um, Qatari you know, um, Emirati influence in Libya that really matters, not American or, Euro or European, I should say. Um, and so there are all kinds of areas in the world in which the United States just disappeared as, a, as even an influence or as a significant player. Um, and I think some of that won't go away. I mean, I think we've, we've retreated from, um, from quite, you know, from, from quite a bit of the world. And of course, the other factor is that, um, okay, Joe Biden will come back. He's appointed some really competent people. He's got an experienced team. You know, they're going to speak to their friends again. Um, they're going to create a coherent foreign policy. Because remember, Trump's foreign policy was, you know, people like to characterize it as populist or as America first. It was all over the place. You know, one day he was best friends with Xi. The next day he was attacking him. You know, it just went back and forth. It had no coherence whatsoever. But you'll get Biden. We'll, we'll do something coherent and strategic and, and comprehensible. But what if in four years that's all thrown up in the air when, I don't know, President Don Jr. wins or... I don't know, Tucker Carlson, the Fox News host, runs for president and upsets the apple cart. I mean, so, and people know that about the United States. And so I think there's going to be some wariness about long-term 
relationships with the U.S. and that is not going away. Um, that's now, I think, a permanent feature in the system. So, you Alex, know, can I jump in here just to ask Carl a question about that point? Because I, I agree with Anne, and I guess I just wonder, Carl, if, if that is necessarily a bad thing. Because I, again, spending six years in Brussels, I remember mm -hmm. all the hand wringing about when are the Europeans going to actually stand up and do a their own security policy? When are the Europeans going to stand up and f form a common, you know, foreign policy? And it was always, eh, you know, eh, we knew the Americans are behind us, and we don't need to do that kind of stuff. At some point now, they realize, as Anne said. Well, ooh, gosh, we just spent four really horrible years. We don't know if it's going to be Biden. And I wonder, again, trying to play the optimist, if there is in some ways a, a silver matter. lining in that the Europeans are finally going to get their act together, or frankly, even the Japanese and the Koreans and the democratic, you know, sort of minded countries in Asia have a similar thing, which they've never cooperated before. Is there maybe a, a good news to the, to the, to the, the Trump horribleness in that regard? What well, think, I would Carl? hope so. Uh, uh, well, I mean, what, what, what you have playing out during the last week, which is 10 days or whatever it is, which has been quite interesting, is an indirect debate between Paris and Berlin on these issues. Uh, I don't know if you saw what sort of Macron came out, 53 pages interview, which is a, would have needed some fairly heavy editing, I would say. Uh, but essentially saying to all Europeans, uh, the world has changed, uh, America no longer there, we have to go on with strategic autonomy by French Rafale plane and forget about F-35s. And then Berlin coming in in the form of the defense minister say, well, well, transatlantic, 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 we need them to deter the Russians. And now is the golden opportunity to go back to sort of a transatlantic relationship to shape the world and face the Chinese or whatever. I mean, both of them are, of course, right. Uh, we have an opportunity now to do things that have not been possible for the last four years. But at the same time, as you pointed out, Peter, and as we discussed earlier, 2024 is four years down the road. Uh, we have no guarantee whatsoever uh, that the American electorate will sort of preserve in his ultimate wisdom um, or that they will go completely bananas again. And, and I do think that we Europeans need to get our act together somewhat more. I think that will also make it as a more relevant partner to the United States, uh, that we are able to do things, actually, and that we are also able, perhaps, to stand up to the Americans when that is needed in order to be somewhat more respected on that side of the Atlantic. That has not always been the case if we go back in history. So there might be slight silver line. But hey, you know, if you look at the nominations from today with Blinken and Sullivan and their francophone background, perhaps uh, the tone will suddenly change. It's that like, ah, we are, nous sommes les États-Unis. We are the United States. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a couple of tweets like that coming from four former French ambassadors saying, look, they're all French educated. This is great stuff. And by you, by the way, written in French. There you go. Hey, mm. now we're moving to the final phase of our conversation. We have 15 minutes left, and we're bringing in two of our, two of our brilliant master students. Uh, first one, and the first question is coming from Lucia Bosoer from uh, Argentina, and the second question is coming from Lucas Wheeler uh, from Germany. We'll start with uh, Lucia. Uh, w welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, in her first speech after winning the election, Kamala Harris noted that while she may be the first woman in the office, she won't be the last, thus showing that the domestic agenda of the next government will be probably informed by a gender perspective. So my question to you is, how do you think Harris' vice presidency will influence the U.S. foreign agenda in the coming years? Who wants to take that one? It's a, it's a tough question because Harris comes to the vice presidency, frankly, like like most presidents and vice presidents, other than Biden himself, and I guess probably George H. W. Bush, without much of a, a foreign international track record. So she's a bit tabula rasa when it comes to foreign policy. She was a prosecutor in California and San Francisco and the attorney general in California. So as you say, most of what she has talked about and advocated for has been a domestic foreign policy agenda, your domestic agenda. Where, where does she bring to the foreign policy agenda? I, I think it's too, frankly, too early to say. It, it may be the case that, as you say, she does put gender issues on the agenda in a way, frankly, Hillary Clinton did as, as, as first lady, where she traveled to Beijing and put women's rights on the agenda and, and, and angered the Chinese in that regard because of, of her emphasis of, of both human and, and, and women's rights in, in China. Um, obviously, she is a, 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 her mother was, was an Indian immigrant, and there's been a lot of, of, of enthusiasm in India because of her, of her election. But I guess my, my general view, is it's, it's too early to say, frankly, and I think in a way that, frankly, it was too early to say about Barack Obama or, or even George W. Bush, uh, these are unformed, these are people who we haven't seen articulate real 
uh, foreign policy visions before they came to the White House or the vice presidency's office. And I think Biden, because he was Senate Foreign Affairs Committee chairman and vice president and has had been on the scene for, for 40 years, we know where he stands. I think the, the, the jury's still out on, on Harris. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. And I would, but I would also say, you know, there are a lot of important things about Harris, um, not just that she's a woman and not just that she's the, the daughter of immigrants. Um, she was also a, you know, she was a Calif California prosecutor. She was a very powerful and important senator. Um, you know, she's not, you know, I, 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 I didn't like this tendency in, 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 you know, in sort of modern political conversation to ask what she will do different because she's a woman. I mean, we might also ask what will she do different because she's from California, which is, you know, which has a very particular view of the world and, and you know, and, and of China and, and of the United States. Um, I mean, of, of course, it's too early to say much about her, but I would also look at some of those past experiences um, to see what she's, what, what issues she'll pick up, what she'll be interested in. Um, I suspect she'll be more involved in U.S. domestic politics, um, particularly on criminal justice issues, um, perhaps on some on race issues. I know that after the demonstrations of last summer, the administration wants some kind of package that deals with I mean, it's you can't really deal with it at a federal level in the United States because these are local issues, but that gets at some of the police reform um, issues that 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 were brought up in those. And I, I can imagine her leading some of that, particularly given her background as a um, in in law enforcement. And I have very little to add that. Just a thought that if if you look back on the record of. Yeah. Lucia, I know that you oh, had oh. some other really call. Can I stop you? Well, no, go no, ahead. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, about that. Often, by often, vice presidents are used are, are used to sort of going around the world and representing the U.S. when the president is bogged down at home, and it might well be that she will spend quite some time on that, uh, both in order to get sort of up to speed on international affairs, and then because I think she will be a rather attractive representative of the United States. Yeah. Uh, but that remains to be seen. It might be that, as Anne said, that her priority will be the different domestic reforms. It's, it's always a different, difficult role to be vice president of the United States. Yeah, Lu Lucia, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you had some really good questions also on, on Latin America. And do, do you want to pop one in our direction, if you have it handy there or if you have it in your head? Because it's an issue that we especially on the European side, quite often forget. So if, if, if something comes to mind on that front, just throw, throw it out there. Yes, yes, thank you, Alex. Um, so the Trump administration pursued a relatively narrow agenda towards Latin America, mainly focusing on stemming illicit immigration and targeted leftist uh, governments in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. So in a context of important challenges coming from China, Russia and the Middle East, do you think there will be a space for Latin America in the next government international agenda? And if so, what do you think will change from the pre previous years? So uh, go ahead. Go ahead Anne. No, I would I was going to say that I you know, I don't know and I I well I have talked a lot to some people in the administration about Europe and Asia, less I haven't had as many conversations about Latin America, but were I to guess um, that the Biden administration will try and um, do the same thing in Latin America that it's trying to do elsewhere, namely organize the democracies. Um, you know, you know, deal with Venezuela, with the, you know, with Canada, with um, with Venezuela's neighbors, um, to try and pull together a democratic-minded agenda in the region, and to and to use that to pressure Venezuela and Cuba. Um, I don't think it's going to be an immediate priority. Um, I think Biden is looking for some immediate wins, and there I don't see any um, in Latin America uh, right away. But but I, I would look at the democracy agenda and the and the attempt to recast that, put that again at the center of American foreign policy as the as the kind of you know the the, the, the lens through which they'll see it. I was going to say exactly the same thing, Anne. I think there, there, again, if I could go back to my original state, statement, which is Biden as a promoter of democracy abroad. I think that's what comes to Latin America in a way that even Obama didn't didn't push it really. And Venezuela being the obvious hot point. I just want to also just put it, this through a domestic political uh, context. As Alex, you mentioned the fact that although 
uh, Hispanics still voted uh, overwhelmingly for Biden, that, that Trump did much better than expected South Florida and along the Texas border. Um, and a lot of this is attributed to, again, we're still doing some reporting on this, um, this sense that a lot of the, the, not only the Cuban Americans, but Venezuelan American vote in Florida and elsewhere um, basically was worried about socialism, right? There is a lot of the, the, the immigrants to the U.S. have come from leftist governments, you know, if you consider Admiral, I guess, a leftist government in Mexico, uh, and come to the U.S. because they are afraid of what those kinds of government bring to them. So I think, you know, you've seen the director of the, the, the Department of Homeland Security is, is a Cuban-American, uh, and I think you're going to start to see a lot more talk about Hispanic issues in Washington because of what happened in, the, in, in, in Texas and in Florida. And I think as a result, that's going to impact American foreign policy to Latin America. So there'll be a lot of domestic political considerations when you think about Biden in Latin America, I think. And I agree with that, that I saw a figure that sort of Biden has been on sort of more official visits to Latin America 29 times. Uh, so he, he knows something about the place. Thank you. Did we lose Alex? Alex appears to be frozen. Yes. Alex, have you disappeared into the Finnish woods? I think we have. Lucas was the other student I think Alex was going to introduce, and I, I think we're going to get Lucas. Bad, to... As you are in my ears, uh, but the answer. <laughs> so move to the next question. Yep. So uh, here comes Lucas. Hear... Great. Uh, you're back, Alex. Yep. 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 Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you all for having me. So I would like to ask the question, and maybe it has pa partly been answered. Uh, right uh, after the election, nice it was argued that- nice to be back, and uh, I heard oh. you all the time. Okay, but so now. I was frozen. Luke, okay, we should go ahead, <laughs> please. Yes. So right after the election, it was argued that while Trump has been defeated, Trumpism as a movement is still very much alive in American society. How do you think uh, this movement will continue to influence American politics, for example, in the Senate? And do you also think that Trumpism will still influence American foreign policy and EU-American relations, uh, NATO or, or multilateralism in general? Uh, so so m my view is that um, we aren't really sure yet what Trumpism without Trump actually means. Who wants to start? Um, I'm. Yeah, you're lagging a little bit, Alex. Go ahead, Ann. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we aren't really sure what Trumpism without Trump actually means. Um, you know, again, people like to, there's a kind of cliche version of what his foreign policy was, which actually had very little to do with what his foreign policy was. Um, you know, he, he talked about isolationism in America first, but really, you know, he spent a he really what he really liked doing was schmoozing with dictators. So it's a you know trying to figure out what that means when he's gone um, is is difficult. And the same is true of these so-called populist economics. You know, what he actually did was cut taxes mostly for wealthier people. And so how you interpret that his agenda going forward um, is difficult. I mean, I think if there is a legacy in U.S. politics, it's the thing that I started out talking about, namely this group of people who live in an alternative reality, who thrive on conspiracy theory, um, who don't believe, not just they don't believe CNN, they don't believe Fox News anymore. Um, and the question is what happens to that constituency and how influential do they remain over the next weeks and months as power seeps away from Trump and as he becomes a, a side figure rather than a central figure. And I think it's it's early to say, but, but tr Trumpism, you know, People act like they know what that is, but you know, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure it's so clear what it means. If if he's if he's out of office, he has access to this big group of supporters. But what exactly do they want? I mean, maybe he wants to earn money from them. Maybe he wants to disrupt things. Um, it's not at all clear that he has a strategy going forward, or that that you know, or that anybody else inside that movement does. I hate to keep quoting Anne back to herself, but your book has been so influential in the way I, I construct some of these thinking. I mean, Anne, what I think points out in her book really, really eloquently is it's not like Trumpism came out of nowhere. The Republican Party has always been a big tent, and there was always this nativist streak. And and, and she writes very eloquently about it, and it really struck a chord with me. 
you never thought in my lifetime you would walk out and see people flying a Confederate flag and that being acceptable. But suddenly that became acceptable. And it, 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 I think what, it, the way, and to, not to put words in your mouth because I, 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 I will not do it justice, but that Trump has been able to activate a small part of the Republican Party and make it preeminent in the tent. And those elements of the Republican Party, you know, come and go. And, and the it's not like everyone in the Republican electorate is somehow now a Trumpista. It's just that the Trump element, the nativist element, the, the, the America first element has become prima to paris. And I guess the question is, how long can they, 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 you know, maintain their power? And are there other elements in the Republican Party, be it be it the free traders or the more institutional Wall Street types or, or the David Frum wing of, of the party that are going to be able to strategically work harder and overtake that? And I think that's that's going to be the most interesting battle, frankly, the next 12, 18 months or even the next four years. Um, which faction of the Republican Party regroup and are able to take on what is that rump, Trump beast, uh, I mean, Pat Buchanan kind of bit of the party, which has always existed, but has never been preeminent. But it's a, it's, it's a part of the Republican Party that was growing before Trump. I mean, remember the Tea Party uh, and all of those people who are growing and sort of surprised all of us Europeans. And, and Trump has sort of turbocharged that part of the Republican Party. And then where is Mike Pompeo? Where is Ted Cruz? I mean, these are people that are slightly outside of the European spectrum. Uh, they, they, they're not Trump in terms of personality and all of those particular aspects of it. But in policy terms, uh, not very far from it. And they are fairly prominent individuals in the Republican Party. What, whatever policy terms means. Whatever that means. Yeah. yeah. I just, like, again, let me, yeah. To try to play with slightly optimistic, which I don't even feel I believe it before as, as I open my lips. I'll just go back to Ohio. Ohio, John Kasich, Mike DeWine, Rob mm -hmm. Portman. These are all kind of moderate centrist Republicans who are still preeminent in one of the most Republican, most important Republican states in the country. So I guess, I guess my point is there are still elements of what we like to used to think of as sort of mainstream Republicanism that are very much on the national scene and are very much able to make an articulate argument for what mm -hmm. was once a free market, you know, pro-democracy mm -hmm. Republican Party. So I guess I wouldn't count them out completely. I don't think we necessarily have a Nikki Haley or a Mike Pompeo or, or a Ted Cruz as the next nominee. I think there's just as much a chance that we get a more traditional Ohio style Republican uh, re-emerging re uh, in, in the next four years. On that happy note. <laughs> Did we lose Alex again? <laughs> It looks like Alex is frozen again. So maybe we should, the three of us should say thank you <laughs> to the European <laughs> University and your wonderful leadership and and for organizing this spectacular and, and, and lovely event and, and best wishes to all the Great. students. Great. Now the big test here at the end is can you... Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the EIU's next project is to invest in broadband in Helsinki. I think that's the... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Finns are supposed to be very advanced on Still here. things like internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the decline of Nokia is the decline of internet in Finland, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think okay. Anne has, Anne has to leave for yeah. something and I have to leave for something as well, and Peter perhaps has. But th thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, everyone. And yep. uh, good luck and uh, spend time with your studies. Yeah. And we'll finish off with a video. And we'll finish off with a video. Oh. I give up. I'm going to change. I'm going to change my broadband, guys. <laughs> <laughs>